know that God wants you to do something, you have to go forward and do it. And there's really no holding back. I don't want to sit and think about what I didn't do in this time. When you're helping someone, you see the joy on their face because of what Jesus is doing in their life, like changes the game. And be able to see their lives change like God changed my life. I've got so much to look forward to as to what God's going to do to fulfill his plan in my life. He has a hope and a future for me. But when you say yes to God, you can trust him. Multiplication is going to happen because God's love and presence is so powerful here. Think with me for a moment. What comes to your mind when I, when you think of a movement, maybe it's a social movement or possibly even a political movement or I don't know, maybe a historical movement or maybe even a religious movement. What comes to my mind when I think of a movement is a spiritual movement. The one that Jesus started I mean, 2,000 years ago, and it continues to this day. The one that he began with 12 people, and now it's over 2.5 billion people in our world. The one that changed my life, and I know it changed many of your lives too. That's the movement that I think about. Dictionary.com, they define a movement as this. They say it's a group of people working together to advance a shared cause. That's the movement. That's a movement that we're gonna work together to advance something, this cause. Well, what is our cause? Well, it's simple, really, but often misunderstood. That God sent his son to this world to live a perfect life. He died a death he didn't deserve, he went to the cross, he rose again to give us new life. That's the gospel. And that's the movement that we're part of. That's the movement that we wanna keep moving. So my question today is simply this. How do we keep the movement moving? In a day and age where if we're honest, Many people, even in the church, they're deconstructing their faith. They're taking a step back instead of taking a step forward. Or in our culture, people who are studying it will tell us in this day that what? That the church now, there's more people who are not just unchurched, but de-churched. That we're living in a secular culture where most people, they're not maybe like you, where they grew up with any church background at all. How do we keep the movement moving? That's what we're gonna talk about today, next week, next month, the next month, all the way to Thanksgiving. We just have one simple question because it's that important, it's that serious, it's not some simple answer. I don't have the answer. That's why we're gonna look at a church one of the first churches that was on the move. And they knew how to keep the movement moving because they got it going. And so we're gonna take a look at what they did so that we know what we can do to keep the movement moving. So we're gonna study the book of Ephesians. If you have a Bible, go ahead and turn to Ephesians chapter one. We're gonna look line by line, chapter by chapter, verse by verse, word by word. It's gonna take us all the way to Thanksgiving. And so this book, let me give you a preview. This is where we're headed. Today, we're gonna to look at chapter one. We're gonna talk about moving with confidence. And I wanna give you five confidence builders to help us keep the movement moving. And then next week, we're gonna look at chapter one again, we're gonna talk about moving with insight. Chapter two is all about moving with faith and oneness, and chapter three is 
moving with compassion and completeness. This is what we're thinking. This is where we're headed. It, it might change if God moves us in a different direction, but this is the plan so far. We're going to talk in Ephesians chapter 4 of moving with unity and maturity. How many would agree with me that that's two things that we need in our day? Unity and maturity. I mean, we've never been so divided, even in the church. And I think our unity depends upon our maturity. Anybody with me? I think more maturity would equal more unity. And so I can hardly wait to get to that. But then we're going to talk about chapter 5, moving with love and moving with purpose. And then we'll finish off in chapter 6, which those who've read this letter before, you may remember that that's a big chapter on spiritual warfare. And and so we're going to, man, how do we move with strength and how do we move with power? So we'll leave that up for a moment. That's where we're headed. So no pun intended. Let's get moving. All pun intended. Let's get moving, right? So let me begin in Ephesians chapter 1. Paul, the writer of the letter, says this. An apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, to the saints who are in Ephesus, that's where it was written to, this church, and are faithful in Christ Jesus, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the greeting in chapter 1, verse 1 and 2. Now look at verse 3. This is what we're going to get into today. Blessed be the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love he predestined and adopted us through Jesus Christ according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace which he has blessed us in the Beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will, according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ, as the plan for the fullness of time, to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. In him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, so that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. First confidence builder, if you're a note taker, go ahead and write this down, that we have been chosen for such a time as this. We've been picked and we've been placed. You've been picked and placed in this season, in this time, in this century, You've been picked in place in that family, in the workplace, in your community, even in this church. It wasn't some illogical decision. It wasn't haphazard. It was extremely intentional and purposeful. God handpicked you for this season. That's what the Bible's teaching. He's picked us. That's what it says in verse 3. He told that church there. He chose us in him before the foundation of the world. So he chose the Ephesians to live in the first century. He didn't choose them for the fourth century. He didn't choose them for the fifth century. He didn't choose them for the 10th century or the 15th. He chose the first. He made that decision before the foundation of the earth, before time was even understood. Just like he didn't place you and I in the 21st century because he knew we couldn't live without the internet. That's not why he picked us. He didn't pick us in places in this century for that reason. Well, what's the reason? And this is where sometimes, it, you know, it's like, okay, what, what do you think? Like, let's talk, like perspective, like group think. Like, okay, everybody, what, what, what do you think? What, what do you think the answer to that? What, what do you guys think? Like, I, I care what you think, but honestly, this is where we don't have to grab it out of thin air. The Bible tells us that we should be homely and blameless. That's why he picked you and placed you in this time, in this season. That you would be holy, meaning this, that he set you apart for his purposes, his plan, his agenda, his initiative, his mission, his movement. He wants you to be holy. That's why he picked you. That's why he placed you and put us in this season and time. It's not unintentional. It's extremely intentional. And then the second word, that we would be blameless. What's that mean? 
Well, he picked you in this season so that you could be a good representative for him, so that you'd be a good witness. Not perfect, but so that others would look at you and say, whoa, that person is a little different. They think differently. They act differently. They, they have a desire for different things than most other people because they are different. Because you've been picked, you've been placed by God. So that's the reason he chose us, that we would be holy and blameless before him. Second confidence builder is that what? We would have been adopted into God's family. Man, I love this one, that, that he adopted you. Look with me at what it says in verse 5. Two theological terms, he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ. Now, predestined, anytime you see it in the Bible, nearly every time, it's always referring to God's purposes, God's plans, what he wants to do. When we see adoption, nearly every time in the Bible, it's talking about God's people. So think with me for a moment that we've been predestined for God's purposes and plans because we are God's people that have been adopted into his family. Make sense? So God's got an agenda, God's got a plan, God's got a movement that's moving, and he has predestined some people. He's picked you and he's placed you and he's adopted you into his family to do his desire. We've been predestined, we've been adopted. Now, this could run us into a little trouble because we're reading the Bible written in the, you know, a long time ago and to this first century group, their culture context, very different than ours, as sons. Well, what about the daughters? Is God a he-man, woman hater? What's happening here? And before our mind runs off, it's important for us as we're looking at God's word, whether you believe it to be true or not, and maybe you're joining us online, and you're just investigating, trying to figure all this out. I don't know if I believe all this. Well, this, this, this is what God's saying. As we interpret it, we need to put ourselves back in their day. And so when they would read this back in their day, the reason it says sons is extremely important because that means to them, the first century readers, that would mean that that means that they received the full inheritance. The sons were the only ones that would receive the fullness of the inheritance, so that's why it says sons. Now, I got three daughters, so I don't know. I guess nobody's getting the inheritance. If I was living in that day, well, there's not too much inheritance to give, so I guess it doesn't matter. But in all seriousness, for us now, as we read it, you don't necessarily have to add to or scratch your Bibles out in your Bibles what it says, but as for us, as followers of Christ, sons is referring to sons and daughters who will receive the fullness of the inheritance in him. Can I get an amen? That's what we're receiving. The fullness of all he has to offer. And that's one of the major themes in Ephesians chapter 1 is the richness and the benefits. I mean, it's a theological goldmine of all we receive in Christ. It's like a brain scrub because we think differently that, that God wants you to understand who you are in him. And so I know a bit about this adoption. For some of you, you know my story. I'm not going to tell you the whole thing. And, and I, like I was adopted as a three-month-old by Jim and Helen Zappia. And some are like, oh, you've heard you say this a hundred times. I, 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 let me tell you something new about this story. So what I don't usually say is that my dad actually provided, my, my kids are still getting the privilege of my dad and my adoption because my dad's inheritance is paid for our kids' college education. My dad, and he's still paying. And, and so that scripture, I love that it says, a good man provides an inheritance for his children's children. That, that's James Zappian. That, that was my dad. That was a benefit that, that my girls are still enjoying. But another part of the story, I, I, I don't want to say too much, and I want to be as respectful as I can, but my parents gave me everything, all the privileges and all the benefits, and love them for that. But when my mom and dad died, my birth mom contacted me, and, and it was like, I didn't, I didn't wanna, like I wouldn't have met with her if my parents were still alive. 
And so that was just me. It wasn't like they said that or anything, but I just almost felt like that was kind of disrespectful. I just, I just wouldn't do it. Plus, in those days, and I'm, I'm so thankful for all the people that adopt now. Let's give it up for, I mean, praise God for those who are adopting kids. Such a great thing. We've got many in our church that, that are doing that. And, and, but in my day, it was what's called a closed adoption. So it was very different. So, so it was illegal for me to talk. You know, like you're not supposed to get a hold of them. It's very different today. And, and so when I did finally meet her after my parents died, I, as I listened to her tell the story and the backdrop of all that happened, I mean, I, I just want to be as respectful as I can, but I walked away from that thinking, I, I was more thankful than ever before for Jim and Helen Zappia for adopting me as a three-month-old because only God knows what would have happened if I had gone in that different direction. Like, I mean, it hit me like a ton of bricks. Like I, like I had never thought about it. Like I was so grateful for what path that I was on. And I think the same is true for us sometimes as followers of Christ. We know we've been adopted into his family, but we don't recognize the greatness of the benefits that he has for us, amen? He's got so much, and sometimes we're not thinking about what we could be or where we could be if it wasn't for him. I love how John Piper says it. He says the gospel is not a picture of adoption. Adoption is a picture of the gospel. That's the picture that we have. And so I want to try to do this today. I'm, I'm, I'm not trying to do this. Like when I was in college, I played basketball, and we get in the locker room, and, and we did what we call PMA, positive mental attitude. And so back in these days, it's like, you know, they had those boom boxes. Do you remember the boom boxes you used to carry in like this? And, and you know, you'd have these boom boxes. Somebody's like, what's a boom box? Just look it up on the internet. I know there's little things now that do the same thing, but we'd put it in the locker room, and, and, then, and then they'd be playing, we'd be playing music from it. And it would be like, yeah, man, we're going to, yeah, we're going to go. We're going to win this, man. Come on. And we're just punching each other and shaking each other. And man, we're going to, come on. And we come out of the locker room, man. We could conquer the world, man. We're just going to, man, we are the champions. We are. I, I'm not talking about that. Although that was good. It was fun. But, but that has nothing to do with what I'm saying. This isn't about positive mental attitude. This isn't something you can muster up in and of yourself and look at yourself in the mirror and, and, and psych yourself into it. It's not at all. But that leads us to the third thing. that This is why we've been forgiven of our sin and shame. Like that's the confidence builder. Because we look at ourselves in the mirror. We're not firing ourselves for what we've done or what we passed it, man, we've been forgiven. Man, sometimes we just get held back if, by our sin and our shame. And, and God wants to paint a new picture for you. And so it says it in the verses. Look at Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7. It says, in him we have redemption through his blood. And, and so the in him here, make no mistake, it's referring specifically to Jesus Christ. And it says Christ Jesus or Jesus Christ. Ten times in this letter, Paul refers to him, the person of Christ. So it's extremely important. Like, understand this is who he is and what he's done. Now, you may be thinking to yourself, is there a difference? Because if you look intently at verse 1, it says Christ Jesus. Paul is one of the only readers, in the, or one of the readers primarily, that calls Jesus Christ Jesus versus Jesus Christ. Is there a difference? Some would say, well, he's putting the emphasis, Jesus was his name, Christ was his title, his position, the Messiah. And so he's emphasizing the deity of Christ. Some have suggested that, well, he does that because he never really walked with Jesus on this earth. If Paul met Jesus after Jesus rose, and he wasn't one of the 12 original disciples, so he's being respectful. I, I, I don't know. All I know is he's saying Christ Jesus, Jesus Christ, because it's really important what he did. He redeemed us. He's the Savior. He was the long-anticipated, promised one. And so redemption, theological term, it simply means to be bought back and brought back. That's the way I think of it. Bought back from what? From my sin and my shame and my suffering. That's what the cross did. Brought back 
to new life. That's what we have, a new lease on life. Where would you be without the forgiveness of sin? You've been bought back. You've been brought back. You've been picked and placed for this season, for a reason, for the redemption. How? Again, I really love each of you, and we could ask, well, what do you think? What do you think? How did that happen? Well, it, it, it's right here. It's through his blood. And again, whether you believe the Bible to be true or not, God's word teaches that it's through Jesus' blood that we've been redeemed. And that sacrifice had to take place because the scripture says without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sin. So in the context of the entire Bible and in the ancient times, that what? That from the Old Testament to the New, that, that something or someone had to die for us to be redeemed, for our sins to be forgiven. In the Old Testament, they have the Old Testament sacrificial system. It was an animal had to die. Blood had to be shed for sin to be forgiven. In the New Testament, it's the Lamb of God. That's Jesus. He's the one. Once and for all, his life was given. So we've been redeemed. We've been bought back and brought back through his blood. The forgiveness of our trespasses. Why would God do such a thing? Well, it's all right here. These are unbelievable verses. It's because of his grace. That word is used in this letter. There's six chapters in this letter. That word is used, a form of it, 13 times. I mean, that's two for every chapter and one extra one just to make sure that we get it. It's his grace. God's grace, our, his undeserved and unmerited favor that you can't positive mental attitude into you this new life and save yourself. God saved you through his son as we embrace the cross of Christ. That's the gospel. That's the grace. Well, you know, I mean, how much grace is there? How much grace are we given? Well, it says he lash, lavishes it upon us. So he gives us as much as we need. I like to think of it, I've used this before, as the you know, chips and salsa at Chili's, man. The bottomless chips, it just keeps coming and coming. Yep, I'll have to eat some more. No, I, don't th I, I think you don't understand. I want another order. Bring it right now. No, I'm still hungry. Yeah, as a matter of fact, could you give me a bag and I'll take some of those home? I mean, as much as you want. As much as you ask for. That's the grace. It's better thought of like this. It's like, it's like the waves that come on the seashore as you're looking at the ocean. They just keep coming and coming. They just keep rolling in. It's just like more grace, more grace, more grace. Well, how much do we need? Well, I'm looking at you guys. You definitely need more than her. And the same goes right here. Last time you'll be sitting in the front. I'm kidding with two people I know because I know the truth is this, that all of us would say this. We need more than we think we do. Isn't it true? Amen. Like we fool ourselves into thinking that we're okay, that we got it together. That, like we always need more than we think we need. And God just graciously gives it. He knows how much you guys need. He much, how much you need. And because of all his wisdom and insight, don't you love this? He just keeps giving and giving and giving. More grace. Because he's redeemed us. Do you know the difference between um, guilt and shame? Guilt, this is, this is probably the most insightful thing I'm going to give you today. Guilt focuses on what I did. It focuses on the consequences of what I did. Whereas shame focuses on who I am. So guilt is the heaviness of what I did, and I can feel a wrong, and that's the shame that I'm beginning, I think I'm unworthy, I think I'm unacceptable, I think I'm no good. We, we frame our thinking, and well, because I did that with the guilt, I have now shame that, that, that nobody cares for me, nobody loves me. I, I... So, so think about it like this, guilt is the activity while shame has to do with your identity. And so that leads us to our next, 
our next confidence builder. That we've been blessed with, catch this, a new identity and a new purpose. So we've been given a new identity. We've got to stop thinking of what we were and who we were and what we did. God's given us a new identity and purpose. And so look at, with me at Ephesians 11 and 12. I'm going to twist this a little bit by saying this. It, see, this is talking about what we're going to get. Again, I, I, Ephesians chapter 1, the whole letter, it's all about the richness that you're going to receive in him. In him, in who? Jesus. Christ Jesus. Jesus Christ. We have obtained an inheritance. We've been predestined. You've been picked and placed. And according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. He knows way more than will us. So we might be the first to hope in Christ. And so for them, that's talking about the urgency of the gospel as they were the first ones to get moving. And we want to be a church on the move, so we're going to get moving. We, we want to give glory to God. But why is it that too many people are taking a step back and, and not giving glory or they're not receiving the fullness of what God wants for them in this life? Man, it's because of the way we think of ourselves. It's because we got to reframe our identity based upon not what we think, but what God thinks. His wisdom is greater than ours. And, and so some of us are stuck playing these old tapes of who we were, and we identify ourselves by a past behavior or a past sin or a past shortcoming or a past mistake or what the kids turned out this way or whatever it is. Some of us, and if I can slow down, I, we're identify we're, we're, we're our identity is in our addiction. And, and that's not who you are. Please hear me. I, 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 we don't name ourselves by what we do wrong. That, that in Christ, I mean, he's given us a new identity. And, and, and so let's take a mid-message break. And, and what I want to do is I want you to see our identity and purpose according to Ephesians chapter 1. And so this should reframe your thinking. This is a brain scrub. This is like a power washing of the heart. That this is who you are. I Ephesians chapter one, we're just gonna go line by line. Verse three says, in Christ we're blessed, not cursed. It goes on in verse four. We've been through this. In Christ we're chosen, not abandoned. You've been placed and picked. In Christ, in verse five, we are wanted, not unwanted. Verse five, I mean just... We're adopted, not orphaned. Man, you're part of his family. In, in Christ, in verse 6, we're what? We're accepted and not unaccepted. Man, we accept anyone, no matter what their skin color is, no matter what their W-2 says, no matter what they were born on this side of tracks or that side of tracks. Man, we want everybody. We're all accepted in Christ. In Christ. We're redeemed and not rejected. We've been bought back and brought back in Christ. I mean, this is just, let, the, let God's word reframe your thinking of who you are. We're innocent, man. You're not guilty anymore. In, in Christ, because of his death and resurrection, we are enlightened, not confused. Now, I'm not saying that, I mean, sometimes I feel a little confused. I don't know what's going on, what's up, what's right, what's... And we're living in a day of confusion. Would anybody agree? Identities, sexually speaking. I mean, we're living in a lot of confusion. But, but God's like, hey, I gotta just, I'm gonna give you enlightenment. And then he says this, I mean, we got two more. In Christ, we're rewarded, not punished. And we're gonna get here in a moment. In Christ, we're secure and not insecure. So this is, I'll suggest to you, the new you. This is, I'll get out of the way, I see people taking pictures this is the true you. This is not what we think about ourselves, but what God thinks of us. This is the power of the gospel. I want to throw a couple old school quotes at you. It's um, a guy who helped Jody and I. And in, in when we first became Christians, we read a, a, a couple books by a guy named um, Neil Anderson. And he wrote all kinds of books and helps, helped me figure out my identity and I wasn't who I was or who I had been, but this is who you are. And it's like an exclamation point. And I used to put some of these quotes on, you know, we used to do it like this. You used to just, you know, put it on a note card or put it on a post-it note and put it, you know, in a place on your mirror or something. And, and now, you know, you got a wallpaper on your phone, but 
But, but this is what he writes. He says, remember what you do doesn't determine who you are. Who you are determines what you do. Like sometimes we just have it backwards. He goes on to say this, the most important belief we possess is a true knowledge of who God is. The second most important belief is who we are as children of God because we cannot consistently behave in a way that is inconsistent with how we perceive ourselves. Good stuff. Third one. We don't serve God to gain his acceptance. We are accepted, so we serve God. We don't follow him to be loved. We are loved, so that's why we follow him. It is not what we do that determines who we are. It is who we are that determines what we do. Man, exclamation point. So this is our identity and purpose. Lastly, talking about confidence builders, I just, you know, I'm trying to build our confidence, and this is almost like, Man, this is the end cap. We've been sealed with the Holy Spirit. And so the Holy Spirit is the third person of the Trinity. And the third person of the Trinity is the guarantor of success that God has placed in you. I like to think of it as a little piece of himself that, that the Bible teaches that for the believer, the Spirit comforts us, the Spirit leads us, the Spirit guides us. The Spirit's like that voice inside of you, much stronger than a conscience, that, that we can quench the Spirit at times. We can even grieve the Spirit, the Scripture says. But we're to be filled with the Spirit. That's what Paul says in Ephesians chapter 5. We're going to get in this series. That's how we keep moving, is that we don't want to grieve the Spirit. We don't want to do this. We don't want to quench the Spirit. We want to be filled with the Spirit. And to be filled, it literally means in its original language that it would permeate your entire being. So you guys have been picked in place, you've been picked in place, you've been picked in place to be holy and blameless, and you ain't on your own. You've been adopted into God's family that by his spirit, he's gonna make some things happen in you that you couldn't make happen by yourself. That's the Holy Spirit's role. But we gotta submit ourselves to God's spirit. We've gotta allow him to lead us. So let me ask you this question. It's an important one. And so, um, you know what? Let's put the verses on the screen first. Not that I don't trust that you're going to get the right answer, but I'm going to ask a question, and then somebody's going to shout out the wrong answer, and then I'm going to be more embarrassed for you than you. So let's put this on the screen. And this is an extremely important question for every single person here, every person who wants to be on the move. When does a person receive the Holy Spirit. When you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, when I heard it, the gospel, and then when I believed it for myself, I'm sealed with the promise Holy Spirit. So what that means is at the point of conversion, at the point of belief, that, that sealed is this idea, it's, in its original language, the word comes from um, like a mark that we would get maybe on your passport or you would get it on your license. It's a seal that verified and said, you know, this is official, man. You, you've got it. You're in. And it's like what a notary republic, a public does. They, they put a seal of approval. Yeah. So we receive the Holy Spirit at the moment of salvation. Now, I emphasize that because I've sat at coffee with, in coffee shops around here with people who they, they, they don't recognize, they think they may have lost the Spirit. They, they don't think they have the fullness of the Spirit and there's some kind of second dose. But like, this is what it's saying, man. And I've often heard it said like this. You don't need more of the Spirit. The Spirit needs more of you. That's the truth. So forgive me for a moment, but... Let's have a little fun. I know it may not be the right time. It might not be fun to laugh at this yet. But, I mean, a lot of us, I got the vaccine. Okay. Man, that hurt. Well, now you need another dose. Got that one. Well, you know what? There's actually a variant that came in from someplace else, and you need, oh, oh my arm's getting a little sore. Well, you know what? There's another variant that we just found out about, so you need another. You know what? My arm's kind of sore. Could you just get me right here? Just jab me right there? When it comes to the Holy Spirit, no second dose. Are you hearing me? Yeah. There's no dose. There's no second dose. Amen? 
that th there's no jabbing here and jabbing here and I got a jab here and I got, it's just like, man, we've been vaccinated entirely by God that what? That by his purpose, by his grace, we can be the people he desires us to be. We can move forward in him. And so, hoping that no one will leave the church based upon that illustration. <laughs> man, man, we, we got to keep moving. So you'll notice this as we close. I've presented each of these, what we're calling confidence builders, in the first person singular. English majors will know that. First person singular, that means, or excuse me, plural. English majors are like, yeah, no, you got that, hey, it's plural, what? It's we statements. So I'm talking collectively to the church as a whole. I'm talking collectively to you online as a whole. This is literally the fifth time I've done this message. All those groups of people. To the whole, we're talking collectively to each of you. But I want to finish by giving them to you in the first person singular. Because I want you to apply it to yourself. So why did I do it the other way? This first person plural? Well, because Paul did it that way. But in order for us to be a church on the move... Hear my heart, I don't want to leave anybody behind. And so we're moving. Are you catching that drift? We're moving forward this fall. Like, we don't know where we're going. We don't know what's happening. We don't know the fullness of it, but we are moving. We are moving forward as we study this letter. I mean, can we just praise God for less than an hour ago? Hold on. We just opened up two new locations, St. Charles and Hinsdale. I got pictures and stories on my phone. I mean, it's awesome. We're on the move. He's doing stuff we can. Yeah, I don't know. But Pastor Craig, I was in a meeting with him. I'm just like, why are we doing two on one Sunday? Isn't that a little aggressive? I got voted down. <laughs> we're on the move, man. We're, we're, we're moving forward. And, and I don't want to leave anybody behind. So maybe you're not fully comprehending everything we're saying. But man, you can draft off us for a moment. And no matter where you're at, it's just that our hearts would be open this fall to learning what God wants and what he desires. And, and just let's, let's move forward together. Because our world needs the church. And we as individuals need the church. So I'm going to ask you, if you're able, to stand with me. And I just want to read these now. We're going to read them together. And so I trust you're going to read loudly and boldly as you believe these things. Just work it out. You've been sitting for a bit. I, I want us to say these from the heart that we truly believe. And so say them with me. Let's start now. I've been chosen for such a time as this. I've been adopted into God's family. I've been forgiven of my sin and shame. I've been blessed with a new identity and purpose. I've been sealed with the Holy Spirit. Praise God for his goodness. Praise God for his love. Praise God for his faithfulness in him. Father, I call out to you and I ask that we would confidently declare with boldness who we are in you. And that by song, even right now, that the conviction of our heart that we've been bought back and brought back to new life. And Lord, we've been picked and placed in this season. May you inspire us to live holy and blameless for you. May you help us to have the courage we need to fight the battles that are in front of us. Will you remind us of the forgiveness and grace we have as we continue to do the same things over and over again that are wrong? But because of your grace, we can come to you and you don't reject us and you forgive us and you empower us and you cleanse us. And Lord, so that we can be your vessels, we can be your people, we can be your children, we can be empowered by your spirit because we're children of you. If you agree with that prayer, simply say amen. <laughs>